seen on Free Speech TV and online on Talker TV. This is The Bill Press Show. Here we are at 33 minutes after the hour. It is The Bill Press Show. We are live in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and our studio on Capitol Hill, brought to you today by the National Education Association, the great men and women teachers of America under their uh, dynamic new president, Lily Eskelson Garcia, members of the NEA, creating great public schools for every student in America, you bet. And you can find out more about their great work, important work, at NEA.org. Or you could just ask President Lily Eskelson Garcia. And I would tell you. Who is kind enough to come in studio today with us. Nice to see you, Lily. It's so nice to be here. I love being on your show. Well, thank you. You're very kind. And uh, we salute all of your good members, and thank you for being with us for so long. Uh, And I want to say this is so exciting. I've already talked about this book on the air because it was a week or so ago. uh, I joined Lily and hundreds of friends at a book party for announcing the uh, publication of your book, Rabble Rouser. Rabble Rouser. Or in Spanish, Agitadores. Agitadores. Agitators. It's, I know. It's yeah. a very, very <laughs> phrase. But it's, first of all, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Well, and the beautiful part, I, I wrote it. I wrote the, the biographies of 17 um, rabble rousers that you know, like Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Gandhi. And Cesar people Chavez. You, yes, and people you never heard of, like Frida Zames. I know you have never heard of Frida Zames. You're so, so oh, right, yeah. yeah. But you do want to know about Frida Zames. But my, my husband, He's, Alberto Garcia, did all of the artwork. And it was all donated. He did the layout, which is gorgeous. Um, I mean, the artwork is, is the the. Um, I love that style. You yeah. Look at this one. Yeah, the he's, v- it's you know, very colorful. unique. Cool. Yeah. Yes. Really. Yeah. I fell in love with him over that artwork. So we <laughs> we got married over this book. We did because I didn't want to pay royalties. I figured I'd just marry him and then you know. <laughs> Talk about labor uh, of love. Yes, <laughs> I'm telling you, I know how to bargain. <laughs> <laughs> and and the great thing is also the. The pro- any proceeds from the sale of this book. And we, I think we still have a link up on our website. We did one before. We'll make sure it's, it's still up there uh, to get this copy of Rabble Rousers. Fearless Fighters for Social Justice, Harvey Milk. Harvey These are Milk all people who have made a huge difference. Right. We start with Mother Jones. A lot yeah. of people think that's a magazine. I know. <laughs> you know, it's like, Mother Jones, come on. And I, I visit a lot of schools, and I would routinely ask kids, tell me who your heroes are. Mm. Rock stars, movie stars, really talented, famous people yeah, right. who did not sacrifice for making the world a better place. And I thought, they don't have real heroes. So I wrote this uh, you know, short biographies written. I actually wrote it on a seventh grade level. Any congressman would be able to get through the chapter. <laughs> and and stories about not everybody has a happy ending mm-hmm. in this. But they did what they did to make the world a better place. And they're true heroes. All the proceeds from the book That's go to a wonderful organization that was started by some university students, undocumented university students, called United We Dream. And we've already uh, handed them their first check for sixteen thousand dollars. They're helping immigrant families um, um, fight for uh, just being able to keep their families and I guess together. These, I, I met some of them at uh, yeah. at your book signing, uh, and a couple of them, at least I remember, said proudly, "I am I'm so and so. I'm undocumented." Right. I mean, they weren't hiding the no, fact. No, in fact, that was that was part of what United We Dream was all about, and um, kind of like the gay rights movement. If you're in the shadows, if you, if it's a secret who you are, people can make up scary things about you. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, you're you're an illegal. You know, mass murderers aren't called illegals. There's one <laughs> category of human being on, in the on the planet, and it's a, maybe an eight year old little girl whose parents wanted something better for her and she's in some people's mind and illegal so uh, Gabby Pacheco whose uh, story is the very last story is one of the founders of United We Dream when she was a little girl she said you know if people um, don't know my name if they don't see my face, uh, they can make up scary stories about who I am. Hmm. So as a very young girl, she said, I don't have my papers, but I want to stay. And these are, for the most part, I guess, um, <coughs> the people who are covered by the president's uh, DREAM Act, right? right? the executive order, because we couldn't get it through Congress. Exactly. Who are brought here by their parents because they wanted a better life for their kids. Right. And 
and and they've lived here. There, this is their country. Exactly. Right? Uh, Gabby actually um, is a special ed teacher now, uh, and she has this temporary safe harbor under the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the DACA, mm-hmm. uh, which is right. which is uh, which covers the the Dreamers. Um, and until Congress acts, it's just a waiting place. It's not a permanent law. Only Congress can pass that law. So the only thing that the president could do was something on regulations that allowed them a special um, um, exemption to stay while Congress debated and debates and debates and debates. But um, it's not a permanent solution. Mm-hmm. We we really do need to Absolutely, get Congress to right. act. Now, I want to ask you, because you travel all around the country and uh, meeting and visiting schools, meeting with your with, with your your members, uh, who do I, I mean, I'm a former teacher myself, but as a parent, as a former teacher, as a former student, I just think and I just say this just because you're sitting here. Teaching is the most important job, I believe, in the in the in the, in the world. I mean, I'll 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 let you know. I'll stop you when I disagree with you. Yes, of course, of <laughs> course. That's no, that's I you mean, know. But who very doesn't important get professions. that? I mean, firefighters and police officers and nurses. You know th- that we really depend on too. But teachers the and most teacher important of all. And the teacher taught them how to be all those yeah. things. Yeah. So how. How, what, what do you see? Is it, the president just told us the state of the union? What, what's the state of America's schools today? You know, I will tell you, we have hope right now. We have hope because things have been so bad. <laughs> it's like, first yeah. of all, you have to be careful when you go, it couldn't get worse. You know, oh, Congress is in session. Of course it could get worse. Uh, but what we've lived under now, this 12 years in the desert of no child left untested, mm. where, um, uh, where, where it, you know, it's test and punish, test and punish, We've seen so many, so many horrible things in Oklahoma, the state legislature, because it's not all Congress. Your state legislature can be um, you know, pretty bad, too. Uh, they decided, OK, let's get tough on those third graders. So here's the reading test, some standardized uh, commercial mm-hmm. test that some salesman sold somebody. Um, and if you don't hit this number and someone just picks a number, makes it up, then you don't get to be a fourth grader. 8,000 little eight-year-olds in Oklahoma were told they were failures and they couldn't go to fourth grade, oh, even though no. their teacher said, look, look at all the rest of the things they did that year. They yeah. missed that cut score by a few points. That doesn't mean they can't handle fourth grade. And the governor said, no, we have to hold, oh. you know, to st- something he she called standards but it was insane 8000 fourth graders they, uh, the the parents rebelled the teachers rebelled they marched up to their state capitol they got the law changed the governor vetoed it no. and they had to go back and so finally these kids were allowed to to oh. go to fourth grade but that's the that's the insanity that we've been for we're hopeful that we actually have uh, that things are so bad that Republicans and Democrats, uh, because this no child was passed with bipartisan fanfare in 2002, 12 years ago. Mm-hmm. And now that it's such a disaster, um, even people who have never worked and played well with uh, the National Education Association, <laughs> they're calling our office going, you guys got some ideas? Because oh, we need yeah. out of this stuff. This, is, this isn't working for anybody. So it's so bad that they want to do something. Now, was No Child Left Behind replaced by... I, I have to ask you about Common Core. Is mm-hmm. that was that the next step? Yeah, in? you know there, that's probably the most misunderstood um, uh, part of the educational debate right now. Um, Common Core has nothing to do with No Child Left Behind, um, but the way it's being implemented can be either very good or very bad. What they have are, we've never had national standards. There's nef- never been anything that said, you know, I taught, uh, I taught sixth grade. There's nef- never been anything that says all sixth graders in America should know how to multiply fractions or, um, you know, should know how to do some particular math problem or read at a certain level. That's um, mostly been states. Mm-hmm. So state governors got together several years ago and said, let's have state standards we can all agree on and the standards came out uh some people love them some people don't um but where we know it's working is where they've trained teachers where they've said how would you teach 
kids to know their times tables. We're mm-hmm. not going to tell you how to do it. We're going to say third graders should know their times tables. Um, where it hasn't worked, places like New York. Um, here's another standardized test. Your kids have to oh. hit this cut mm. score, or you're a bad teacher, or you don't get to graduate high school. Where they just, they're so caught on this. Well, someone has to be punished if kids don't hit a cut score. Mm. So where they're doing that to perfectly good standards, it's going to it's gonna corrupt teaching and learning. So, it, so at one time, what I don't understand is even Republican governors kind of liked this at one time, right? And now suddenly it's become this political football. Yeah, it is. And any all things um, educational now, no matter how common sense, um, people want to pull apart and make into some partisan uh, problem. You know, you have to go all the way back to the federal role, which was very, very limited in education. 1965, 50 years ago, Lyndon Johnson, in the war on poverty and civil rights legislation, he said, you know, in schools, they're really not taking care of some of our poorest kids, our minority kids, our children with disabilities. And that was his background, too. That, that's yeah, where he exactly. Started. He was a teacher. Yeah, uh, yeah. And and he said, we can't tell states what to do, but let's give them some extra money for reading tutors for poor kids. Let's give them some teacher training um, money so that they can deal with uh, English language learners. And that's what the 1965 um, boringly named <laughs> Elementary Element. and Secondary Education Act. We loved it when it had a boring name. Every yeah. 10 years, they reauthorize um, ESEA, and every 10 years, they call it something new. George Bush called it No oh. Child oh. Left Untested. <laughs> and he changed the whole thing from saying, here's some extra help, to, to hmm, federal role is to tell you to give standardized tests, to rank your schools, to label them failures or successes by how many, you know, did you hit your quota of kids getting a cut score on a standardized test, and federal punishments that would kick in um, if um, your school school wasn't making adequate yearly progress to hitting this quota of kids that had to go up each year until, and this is what people have just figured out, the magical year 2014, which if I'm not mistaken, I checked my watch, we just passed, (laughs) okay? 2014 was like 12 years later. 100% of human-type children would be above average. (laughs) No No Child Left Behind was was written to say all special ed kids will read on grade level, and every child that had a fight with his mom this morning and is, you know, not going to circle the the right number just because they're rebellious, 100% of kids will be above average. That was a joke on Prairie Home Companion. Yeah, by last year. Oh, oh, yes. So oh. now that's wow. that is how Boy. bad it is. Oh, man. And that's why they have to fix it. Wow. Lily Eskelson, Eskelson Garcia, sorry. Oof, what was, uh, she says she has hope in American schools. We do, too, because she's in charge now. Uh, she said of the NEA. We'll be right back. You have a question or a comment. Parents, teachers, students, all welcome at 866-55-PRESS. This is the Bill Press Show. Just this month, my bill was like $138. Even at one phone call a week, it cost me 40 to $50 every month. I am living on a fixed income of SSI, so this is really a great hardship. Families are being punished. When they incarcerate their children, they incarcerate the whole family. In 2011, the Media Action Grassroots Network, Working Narratives, and Prison Legal News founded the Campaign for Prison Phone Justice an effort to call on the FCC to address the cost of interstate phone calls. The campaign mobilized prisoners to send hundreds of letters. Advocates and families filled out postcards, met with elected officials, and signed petitions. Partnerships were formed across the political spectrum and with groups in the criminal justice, 
civil rights, and public interest community. The film distribution company Participant Media and director Ava DuVernay joined the fight through a social action campaign tied to the release of the feature film Middle of Nowhere. In an effort to push the FCC to act, the campaign hosted a historic rally outside of the Federal Communications Commission where for the first time families of prisoners, elected officials, civil rights and faith leaders came together to call for an end to predatory phone rates. We're all held captive when predatory phone companies gouge our families. My son has been incarcerated now for over 10 years, and my husband estimates that in the time we spent over $25,000 on prison phone calls. My hero's not yours, you probably arrested them. Your school's probably neglected them. They spawn thoughts, you probably infected them. Feed us what you feed us, you can lay us next to them. FBI call it major crimes. Babies making babies cry. Two anti-government, self-described revolutionaries have shot up a pizza restaurant as well as a Walmart in Las Vegas. The internationally syndicated political series, The David Pacman Show, provides progressive talk, analysis, and interviews with the nation's youngest radio and television host, David Pacman. Find out more and catch up on all the latest episodes by visiting our website at freespeech.org. most valuable morning radio show according to the nation magazine this is the bill press show 10 minutes now before the hour on this wednesday january 28 uh, a great morning because lily eskelson garcia president of the nea uh i keep calling you the new president it's been, <laughs> been about a year now has the it? clock's ticking Almost? it's september 1 i got to be um the president just september okay yeah. well it's still yeah it's still new we've been working hard uh, you have been all around all over the place uh and president of the nea here in, in studio with us um and Lily, let's say hello to Bernice out in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hello, Bernice. Good morning, both of you. Um, all of you there, actually. I'm yeah. a former uh, local NEA president, one of the measly ones. Whoa! Oh, no, no, right. no, 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 no. And it's early out there in, in New Mexico. <laughs> yes, um, and we love what you are doing, too. But I want to tell you, there are winners in this No Child Left Untested. The winners, of course, are the testing companies, yep. the curriculum companies that have to, you know, be mm. used to make the tests uh, worthwhile, the consultants that we pay thousands and thousands of dollars to, uh, and private education companies, um, what the people that are pushing private ed, because the more they look, make us look incompetent, the more they look, make us look bad, the more they can call us. I'm at a D school. I was at an F school. The more that we look bad, the better they look, and the more it looks like, oh, these people are not handling it. We need to take over public ed. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk to a lot of people who um, um, I say exactly what you just said, and they go, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. Come on. And I, I, you know, I said, look at the dollars. Follow the, follow exactly. the money. Come on. I said, if you can scare some superintendent school board, um, look, all your schools are turning into failures. Here's my magical curriculum, my textbook, my training for your teachers, they're packaging this stuff. Guaranteed, buy now and you can get your test scores up 10 points. Um, there's, there are salesmen who are making huge commissions out of selling things to frightened school board members who don't want to um, don't want to look like they're failing their children. Um, mm -hmm. And none of it's working, but we're wasting time, we're wasting money, we're spending more time on test prep than really quality time with our students. And it's impacting our poorest kids the most. Yeah. Um, you know what I think is so important in schools: arts and arts and music. And oh, you radical you! I know, <laughs> <laughs> but we're losing that, aren't we? Well, I'll tell you again. 
The If you walk into, as I've done, I've gone to so many states, I said, show me the school to die for. Show me that place, the yeah. McMansions, where people are selling a kidney so they can live in a school area where their kid can go to this incredible, fabulous public school. And you can probably tell in any state where that is. Where I, mm-hmm. you know, where I lived for 30 years, it's Park City High School. You know, anything under a ski resort is going to have a lot of money yeah. and a lot of rich mm-hmm. skiers. Um, and you walk in there, they have the athletic departments, the arts departments, they've oh, got yeah. the, the computer labs, and you name it, they've got everything. And their parents insist on it, because every one of those kids is going to Harvard. And what I want now, under this no child left, I want to leave behind the incredibly insane, wasteful testing that has gone on that tells us nothing about those children. And I want to hold governors, state legislators, I want to hold the policymakers accountable. I want to walk into Park City High School, and I want a checklist that says, here's all the programs, the AP Mm -hmm. classes, the after-school programs, the school nurse and counselor that you have, the support staff, and then I want to take that list that those wealthy parents say, um, this is what my kid needs to succeed, because they're right. Yeah, They're right. Mm-hmm. And I want to take it to the poorest school and say, where is the gap in the resources that you put into these schools? Where are these kids then, who live in poverty, where's their opportunity to learn? And then let's learn? close that gap and give everybody That's the right. equal opportunity. That's why we are so glad you are where you are. Thank you. And thank you for coming in this it's morning. It's always Lily a Eskelson pleasure, Garcia. Thank you. Check our website or just go to Amazon.com. Rabble Rousers. Uh, it's a great, great book. Uh, great stories. Uh, I'll give you hope in America again. Thanks, Lily. Nice to see you. Thanks again. All right. We'll be right back. Close things up. This is the Bill Press Show. It is possible to read the history of this country as one long struggle to extend the liberties established in our Constitution to everyone in America. In other words, who, according to our laws and culture, gets to be considered a person? The law creates legal personhood, and movements create law and change culture. So... How have the courts passed laws to shape our culture? That history goes way back before Citizens United. 1819, Dartmouth College versus Woodward, Supreme Court case, turned a corporate charter from a government-granted charter to a contract. This ruling gave corporations standing within the Constitution. 1886, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. Though the court did not rule on corporate personhood, the decision was subsequently cited as a precedent to hold that a private corporation is entitled to the same 14th Amendment rights of due process and equal protection as human beings. This makes it impossible for us to make laws that treat local businesses any differently than giant multinational corporations, even if their business practices are deemed to be harmful to workers, the environment and communities, or if they have a history of violating the law. Hale v. Henkel, 1906. The court granted corporations the Fourth Amendment search and seizure protection. Dodge v. Ford Motor Company, 1919. The Michigan Supreme Court says, the business corporation is organized and carried on primarily for the profit of the stockholders. Stockholder primacy is established. The purpose of the corporation, according to the court, is no longer to serve the public good as it had been it is now to maximize profit for shareholders above all else pennsylvania coal company versus mahon 1922 corporations get the fifth amendment takings clause meaning if you pass a regulation that impacts a corporation's ability to make a profit that is deemed a taking and they can sue for the right to future profits lost this creates a chilling effect and local and state governments become much more hesitant to pass laws in the public interest for fear that corporations can claim loss of potential profits that cities and states will be on the hook to pay. Buckley v. Vallejo, 1976. The Supreme Court rules that spending money to influence elections is protected under the First Amendment, in effect saying that money is speech. Citizens United v. Federal Election Commission. 2010.
Today, the Supreme Court of Chief Justice John Roberts declared that because of the alchemy of its 19th century predecessors in deciding that corporations had all the rights of people, any restrictions on how these corporate beings spend their money on political advertising are unconstitutional. The court's ruling threatens to undermine the integrity of elected institutions across the nation. It's a rejection of the common sense of the American people. No time for a parting shot today, but it was fun to visit with Lily Eskelson Garcia. I'll be down at the White House for the briefing today at uh, one fifteen with Deputy Press Secretary Eric Schultz. And we'll have that to talk about and a whole lot more uh, tomorrow here on the Bill Press Show. So this Wednesday, January, January 28th, make it a good one and uh, come back and see this us again tomorrow morning. This is the Bill we'll Press Show. You.